Uh, thank you very much to uh, John, to the organizers uh, for inviting me. I'm very pleased to, to, to be here. Good morning to everybody. So I will uh, talk this morning about uh, time scales of, uh, of porphyry deposits, but uh, I will try to, to talk more of, about the meaning of, uh, of what time scales can, can give to us in the understanding of, uh, of these uh, systems. So I would like to start uh, with the this picture, which is a general architecture uh, of, of a porphyry system, and is what we, we see in the field when, when we go. And this is a model which comes out from uh, hundreds and, and of, uh, of studies that have been done in the field. So we have these porphyry fingers, which are often multiphasic with the alteration envelope, the ore shell, and the various types of uh, ore deposit system that are associated with, uh, with this porphyry. So the, the porphyry sensus strictus, carn, epithermal of uh, high sulfidation or intermediate, and uh, more distal carbonate replacement type uh, deposit. So this is what we see, and uh, this is what we, we get the samples from to get uh, a lot of information. And uh, we know quite well, as Jamie uh, has told yesterday from tens of years of, of studies, uh, these uh, systems. It's also here that we get uh, the samples that we date, and uh, the time scales that we infer for these uh, uh, systems. Of course, as also Jamie, I took again a slide from, from his talk of, of yesterday, has shown there are other processes which precede all this uh, story. And these processes are happening deeper from uh, the mantle wedge or even the slab through the crust and up to the system that we see exposed. And of course, these uh, uh, processes are probably also very important, and actually they are surely very important in the generation of, uh, of the final porphyry deposit. But of course they are less understood because we have less access to what is happening deep in the, in the crust and in the mantle. So what uh, I would like to address is the question, can we make a link from the observations that we can do in the most superficial part of these systems uh, to infer what is happening deeper in, uh, in, in these systems. And I would like to show what the time scales can give us in this perspective. So I will st start with a very simple uh, model based on, on mass balance, <coughs> which uh, starts from the copper endowment of, of uh, any kind of system. So we have a deposit which uh, contains a certain amount of copper. If you go backwards to understand what happened and what are the processes which led to this accumulation of, of, uh, of copper, the first step that we have to do is that we know that this copper has been precipitated by magmatic hydrothermal fluids. And uh, we know that a certain amount of copper must be precipitated by a certain amount of fluid, which depends on the copper concentration of the fluid and, of course, the precipitation efficiency. If uh, for the moment we disregard the precipitation efficiency effect, or we say that it is more or less the same in different systems, which is not proved, of course, but uh, let's do this assumption, the fluid volume in its turn, because it's a magmatic fluid, will depend on the amount of magma, which uh, uh, is uh, responsible for the fluid exolution. And the copper concentration in the fluid through the partition coefficient between fluid and melt will depend on the copper concentration of the magma volume. So, uh, because, uh, let's say, this uh, number here is uh, relatively constant, or it, there are changes, but uh, as I will show you later some Monte Carlo simulation that we have done with the random variability of uh, uh, KDs for copper within uh, the known range is not so affecting the, uh, the, the end uh, product. The main player seem to be the magma volume and the copper concentration in, in, in the magma. And these uh, actually depend in turn on processes which are even at a larger scale. So we are going from uh, the surface deeper in theory, in this uh, uh, theoretical exercise. Because magma volumes that uh, we can accumulate in the crust, of course, depend from thermal constraints which are uh, present in the crust, pressure, temperature, composition. And composition also plays a role in determining what is the copper concentration. And so how do timescales uh, enter in question here? 
Well, I would say that there are two time scales that we can consider in these systems. One is the time scales that uh, control the rate of precipitation of copper in the deposit. So is the, how long does it take to form the mineralization itself? But the other one is also very important is uh, how long does it take to get enough magma to exolve enough fluid to precipitate what the, the amount of copper that we see. So I will talk in the, in the next of these uh, two kinds of time scales. And we have done uh, some uh, um, preliminary, very simple modeling, you will see. It's a, of course, there are many assumptions, many simplifications, but uh, I think it's a good starting point. And what I would like to point out is that there is a need really to refine these models through uh, integrated studies of geological and geochronological studies on, on my point of view, but of course also all other kind of studies that can implement and uh, improve our understandings of, of these systems. So what about the time scales of uh, uh, precipitation of, of uh, metals in porphyry deposits? We, we can address the, this problem from different points of view. There are people who work with, uh, with modeling and they have shown that uh, uh, from numerical thermodynamic modeling, the lifetime of hydrothermal systems connected with the uh, single pulses of intrusion is very short. It's on the orders of few tens of uh, thousands, or few tens of thousands of years, or even few thousands of years. We can also look at, at the problem from, uh, this is a recent study from uh, uh, Merce, Celeste, Celeste Merce, on the titanium diffusion in, in uh, hydrothermal quartz, in magmatic quartz associated with porphyry, time scales uh, are even shorter, on the order of hundreds of years. So very short uh, event seem to be associated with uh, the, uh, uh, the precipitation of, uh, of metals of, uh, um, in this kind of, of systems. Of course, when we look uh, at the geology of, uh, of these deposits, the, the thing seems to be more complex because we have not one single episodes of, uh, of intrusion, of hydrothermal fracturing uh, and precipitation, but we have a superposition of, of different events which are related to subsequent pulses of uh, uh, intrusions. And uh, all these uh, pulses uh, seem to be associated with cyclical recurrence of uh, alteration assemblages and of precipitation of, of minerals that you can see especially in the higher temperature part of the system. This is probably because uh, these pulses are coming up so uh, frequently that they keep uh, a thermal anomaly alive and they uh, prevent uh, the system from cooling down too rapidly. So we can see this is purely based on uh, uh, temperature determination based on uh, paragenetic association. We can see that uh, the very low temperature systems, the very low temperature mineralo mineralogy, comes out and is expressed only at the end of the, of the multi-cyclical magmatic cycle. So what, uh, how can we address the problem from uh, <clears throat> the point of view of geochronology now? Well, porphyry systems are very uh, suitable because uh, they contain two minerals, or almost universally, two minerals that uh, are datable with the, currently the most accurate and uh, precise techniques, which are uranium lead in zircons and uh, rhenium osmium in uh, molybdenite. I, I won't talk about, uh, there are still problems of cross calibration between the, these techniques. Now the, the level of uh, precision of these techniques has gone down so, so strongly that we can measure with the precision of a few thousands of years uh, samples which are 10 million years old, for instance. <clears throat> so we can resolve uh, in theory problems at, at, at this uh, time, time scales. And what do they tell us? Well, I, I took just a, a few examples. This is one example from, the, from Cyril work from uh, Korokowaiko. It seems to, we seems to have a quite a broad range of uh, lifetimes in, in hydrothermal systems. There are uh, similar works done by Yannick, by Simon Tapster on, on, uh, on porphyry systems of, of the same similar size of, of Korokowaiko. And this kind of, uh, of um, lifetimes in these kinds of systems, which are relatively, well, they are still economic, but relatively uh, small, are on the order of few tens of thousands of years. So these are the uh, uranium-led zircon dating of uh, uh, 
seen to slightly pre or uh, either term uh, porphyry, system, porphyry intrusions, and these are the rhenium osmium dating of the of the mineralization. They overlap within within arrow, uh, which gives us an indication that uh, it was a very rapid deposition. If we go to other kind of systems uh, instead, which are much larger in, in size, we can see that the uh, uh, dating, now we, we consider uranium lead dating in uh, are the blue diamonds and the rhenium osmium, are the, the red squares, uh, are more diluted in time. Well, we have a quite long uh, lifetime for the magmatic and more or less contemporaneous uh, uh, hydrothermal activity recorded by the rhenium osmium, spanning even more than one million years of, uh, of age. I would like to, to show you that the, the argon-argon dates here are mostly recording, as we have seen before qualitatively from the paragenesis uh, of the mineral, only the latest stages, so the waning uh, stages of the, of the thermal system. Just because probably the thermal anomaly was uh, so high all this time that uh, argon never went down to, to, the system went never down to the closure system of, of argon. And dating. And the same we can see also in uh, other very large systems like uh, Rio Blanco, <coughs> in which we have uh, lifespans of uh, over one million years of, uh, of hydrothermal activity coupled with uh, contemporaneous uh, magmatic uh, activity. So the combination of modeling and uh, of uh, radiometric dating of, uh, of porphyry deposits uh, would seem to suggest uh, to us that we have a very short uh, hydrothermal events which lead uh, to instantaneous uh, precipitation of ore minerals, but uh, these are repeated through, through time. And these are, are repeated through time for different time scales, which are ranging from few tens of thousands of years up to one or even more million, million years. And uh, from the qualitative, uh, uh, in, uh, from, from, the, from the observation of these uh, previous slides, we can, it seems to, to be that uh, the larger are the deposits, the longer is the, is the overall lifetime of, of the magmatic hydrothermal systems. So I try to compile uh, a, a, a combination of uh, dating of different kind of uh, porphyry deposits with uh, their copper endowment in a preliminary uh, plot. I think that this is uh, something that has to be strongly uh, improved and uh, tested, but it's a starting point to the following exercise that we, for which we can use time scales to infer deeper processes associated with this kind of system. So this is a plot of, uh, oops, of um, uh, copper million ton endowment of the porphyry over the overall duration of the, of the hydrothermal system. So, of course, you can see some scatter, but if you are optimistic and if you want, you can see that there is some kind of correlation. And uh, because we like also correlations, so because they are very simple to understand and they are very useful to, to model things, you can even put a straight line across it. Okay? But, of course, uh, what does it mean, this scatter? Well, on, on one hand, the, this correlation seems to indicate that you have a, a, almost a constant, the, a similar rate of copper deposition in, in, uh, in porphyry deposits, which would seem to point to a main <coughs> process that uh, governs, that uh, rules the uh, precipitation of, uh, of uh, copper in this kind of deposits. On the other hand, we have, we have scatter. What does it mean? Could be a mis- uh, uh, miscalculations in the, in the copper endowment. Of course, there is a larger uncertainty on, on this value here that uh, mining companies, they give us number, but of course, we, we don't know whether there is something else hidden, what has been sometimes uh, recovered also before. We can have uh, miscalculations also in the time scales because, uh, we, of course, uh, we measure some selected samples and there is always a bias in, in, the, in these samples. There are problems also of cross calibration. These are time scales which are inferred from the combination of uranium and lead and rhenium osmium dating, or sometimes only one, one of the two. So there is a lot of uncertainty, and I think that uh, the, the future work that we need to do is really to refine the time scales 
of uh, these uh, deposits by accurate dating, both uh, with the, uh, the best sampling possible and also by improving the intercalibration between uh, uh, radiometric methods. The other point that, uh, I, that I think it's very important to, to improve is that uh, often, and, and these also overall duration, are based on the beginning and on the end of the hydrothermal activity. But of course, in between, we don't know how the metal has been precipitated. It could be that it has been precipitated randomly or uh, systematically with a, with a similar rate within this time range, or there has been a big pulse at, in a very short time and the rest of the time, there has been only little metal coming in. So it's very important uh, for me in, in the next, uh, uh, in the future, to try to, to link quantitatively the rate of deposition of, uh, of copper by precise dating and evaluation of uh, the endowment of copper that has been precipitated within a certain time scale to better understand the meaning of this, uh, what is apparently now a, a, a correlation. Uh, of course, we can, uh, because we have here a rate of uh, copper deposition, and for, from what we have seen before, we can link this uh, to a certain amount of fluid and to a certain amount of magma, we can infer the rate of, uh, or the magmatic flux, which is responsible for precipitating this kind of, uh, uh, this amount of copper in, in, in the upper crust. And this is a very simple calculation that we have done here, and uh, we come that uh, the, this is the amount of mo volume that, that we need, well, depending on the, on the, kind, on the size of, of the deposit. But uh, look at the fluxes are typical, more or less typical uh, arc, average arc magma fluxes, so nothing particularly special. Well, this is a work of, uh, recent work of, of Cyril. I think he will talk uh, afterwards more in detail about this, but this is a, a, a similar approach in which uh, he combined the lifetime or the duration of a magmatic injection and the associated uh, duration of a uh, fluid release. And what is very important is that uh, we, oops, we can uh, uh, start to, by using this uh, approach and uh, by using, uh, of course, uh, with, again with a, a Monte Carlo uh, 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 approach in this case uh, by, uh, concerning the copper contents in the magma in the, in the fluid within a reasonable uh, range. But what is important is that we can start to quantify the amount of or the endowment of the copper which is associated with a magmatic system which, has, uh, which is controlled by these numbers here. So this, uh, we are coming back and seeing that by accurate geochronology, we can start to go back and to see deeper what is going on in, in the system. And we can see these plots uh, by putting some uh, real examples, as uh, Cyril has done here, in which uh, we have uh, the fields uh, for different kinds of deposits. And basically, we can see that there is a correlation between the amount of magma which is present and which is needed to deposit a certain number of uh, a certain amount of copper and the endowment of the copper deposit. And there is a good correlation between what Cyril has modeled and what is uh, observed. So the, the message is more magma, more uh, copper endowment. <clears throat> so I would like to go now even deeper in, in, in the system, go back to this uh, uh, cartoon, to this uh, very schematic uh, conceptual model. And uh, uh, I've shown before that uh, overall, all this is controlled, uh, the final amount here is essentially controlled by the magma volume and the copper concentration. And I would like to talk uh, a little bit, especially on copper concentration, because, uh, well, we always assume that there is a, a certain uh, copper concentration, but there is a, now a tendency also, or some suspect that uh, copper concentration that could be different in certain magmas. Uh, people talk... Uh, of uh, copper enrichment, uh, some magmas are, are copper rich, other are, are uh, copper poorer. So what is the copper concentration in magma which controls uh, all the down part of, the, of this system? This is important, why? Because uh, of course the copper concentration in the magma will play, just from a simple mass balance point of view, 
on the, on the volume of magma that we need. If we have a magma with a high concentration, we will need a small volume of magma to produce the same amount of, of copper of a large volume of magma with a low concentration. And uh, small and large volume of magma, of course, depend on, uh, as we have seen, thermal constraints in, in the crust, which can be very different. So it is important to have uh, an idea of the copper concentration. So uh, this is a study that I, I have done a few, few years ago by a compilation of, uh, of copper in, in, uh, in arc magmas. These are uh, copper concentrations for arc magmas built on, on thick crust, and these are on, on thin crust. These are the two, the two extremes. What is interesting to see is that uh, in thick crust, which are, the, let's say, the preferred environment for, um, for uh, porphyry copper deposits, uh, we see that there is a systematic decrease of, uh, of copper through magmatic evolution. Uh, in contrast to the evolution of copper in, uh, in thin arc, which show a peak at around uh, between 4 and 6 uh, weight percent magnesium. This is the same plot here, but expressed in terms now of silica, just to, to have a <coughs> a, a, another view. And we can see that uh, the typical ranges of magmas, which are associated with, uh, with porphyry copper deposits, uh, would contain between 50 and 20 ppm. So it's nothing... Uh, is, is nothing exceptional. But are these magmas, those which form the, the porphyry deposits? I, I don't know. These are the magmas, the prevailing magmas that we have in ARC. Could be that porphyries are formed by exceptional magmas that we don't, we don't sample here. But these are the great majority of the magma that we have. And so we try to play and to build up a model with these concentrations of, of, uh, of, of copper and to see what kind of volume of magma we need in order to produce a porphyry copper deposits of different endowments. This uh, plot here shows uh, the cumulative uh, copper contribution by magmas in uh, thick arcs and in, th and in thin arcs. You show that there is a deficit of copper in thin arcs. So what is coming up to the surface in, in thick arcs, it's much less than in thin arcs. So it would seem that uh, there is a loss of copper in thick arcs somewhere in the crust. And we can use uh, some mass balance calculations to, to, to calculate this. And I come up with a figure of uh, about uh, a loss of 8 million tons of copper per million years per kilometer of arc. <clears throat> and so only 4 million tons compared to the 12, which are in the thin arcs, only 4 million tons of copper in, in thick arcs would come up to the close to the surface where they could be eventually uh, exalted. So this poses already some uh, important mass balance constraints on the, on the time scales of porphyry deposits and on the, on the, on the volume of, of magmas. From a semi-quantitative point of view, using, having these uh, kind of copper fluxes, we need a very long time of, uh, of formation for the porphyry deposits, on the orders of several millions of years, which is not compatible with what we observe and what we have from radiometric dating. So the alternative is to have a very large accumulations of magmas. So magmas has to be accumulated and then released in, uh, in, in, in the upper crust in, in, in some way. But uh, it seems that we need this pre precursor step of magma accumulation somewhere in the crust. So what we have done next is to try to understand where and how can we have this accumulation. Well, this is again just based on, on simple mass balance calculation and on the, on the kind of uh, range of copper concentrations in magma the kind of volume that we, we need to have for a 20 million tons uh, copper metal. So in the order of between 500 and 1,000 cubic kilometer without 100% efficiency. So if we consider 50%, we would just need to double this, this amount. So these are huge volumes of, of, of magma. But however, this uh, kind of volume is uh, what the silito has drawn, for instance, typically for this uh, the parental magma body, it's, uh, this is uh, the size of uh, 1,000 cubic kilometer. It compares very well to what uh, is known also from what Cyril has uh, calculated by, with, uh, with this model. So we are in this order of, uh, of, mag of magnitude. The, the next uh, point that I, I would like to address and to, to put, uh, to implement into the model together with the timescales is the 
relationship of magma chemistry with the, or magma fertility indicators with the porphyry systems. This uh, is a slide that uh, Jamie has already shown yesterday, it's from Bob. And uh, well, this is the famous uh, stone symmetrium indicator of, uh, of porphyry deposits. It, uh, all these uh, red dots are mineralized systems versus uh, this field, which is the barren normal uh, magmatic arcs. So we can see that uh, mineralized systems are essentially comprised between strong symmetrium values between 50 and 150. We have a great concentration of, uh, of, uh, of uh, values in this range. <clears throat> so how do we implement uh, this information into our model? What we've done is to start from a, a model of a melt productivity in the, in the crust, and the model that we have used is the model of Annen et al., so the hot zone model, in which basically you have a melt productivity that is the result of a periodic injection of basaltic melt at different levels in the crust at, at a certain rate. We have chosen here uh, the, the rate uh, of a typical average arc uh, magma flux rate, indicated here. And basically, the, result, the melt productivity is the result of the, crystal, the, the, the residual melt, which is crystallizing at different levels. And uh, after a certain incubation time, this uh, continuous injection also starts to produce partial melting of the surrounding crust. So it's the combination is a hybrid melt coming from the residual melt, which is a uh, fractionating in uh, different levels in the crust and partial melt, which is coming from the uh, partial melting of the, of the surrounding crust. And basically, the, the, the uh, indication of this model is that uh, the longer is the duration of injection, the longer you increase the thermal anomaly in the crust, so more melt you produce. Different color codes here indicate the different depth at which uh, the melt productivity occurs. And melt productivity so increases also at higher depth because uh, the temperature of the surrounding rocks is hotter, and so therefore you need to spend more energy to to have more residual melt and to melt the surrounding rocks. So basically, this is the important information to retain here. We have implemented uh, additionally two more information to to the model: is the amount of water in the in the in the melt which is produced uh, in this way, which is uh, strongly dependent on pressure and also on, on composition. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, also tried to implement indications from uh, strontiometrium chemistry. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a very simple model. There is a, a lot that can be refined here, but I think it's, it's a good starting point, and, and you will see the results are quite consistent with, with what we observe. So how did we do these calculations? These are based uh, on experimental, um, on, the, on pathological uh, experiments, uh, which have been carried out uh, at different pressures with the uh, andesitic basaltic magmas. And uh, the points here are resulting from the uh, model proportions of minerals combined with the Monte Carlo approach uh, of uh, KDs for these elements uh, with respect to the minerals, to the model abundances of minerals, which are which have been uh, measured by, during these experiments. So what we can see is that uh, with increasing pressure, we pass from a, a decreasing strontiometrium melt, uh, uh, strontiometrium values in the residual melt with uh, increasing fractionation to slightly increasing and strongly increasing, which is, uh, as uh, we uh, know, the result of plagioclase fractionation at the uh, shallow depth and increasing importance of amphibole and eventually of garnet also at uh, high pressure conditions. So by implementing this in, a, in our model and doing Monte Carlo simulations for a, a range of uh, unconstrained uh, variable, we come up with this kind of plot, which uh, is quite complex. I, I will try to, to guide you. There, are, there is a, quite a, a lot of information. This is the duration of magma injection, and this is the, the pressure at which the magma injection occurs, or the magma accumulation occurs. So let's start first with the, the uh, black lines here. They indicate the amount of uh, uh, melt produced at these different levels and after this injection time. So you can see that the, 
the amount of melt which is produced increases with increasing duration and with increasing pressure. This is the, exactly what uh, we have seen in the previous diagram. The white lines here indicate the amount of water which is dissolved. This is all uh, soluble water within these melts, in gigatons, and again they follow quite uh, similarly the same trend. They, there is a, a slight difference which depends on the changing composition of, of, of the melt, but overall we have the deeper and the longer, the more water there is in the, in the uh, magma which is accumulated. And these are the lines that we obtain with the, our simulations for the strontium yttrium composition of, of the melts. Divided in, there are two lines which divide magmas with less than, uh, strontium yttrium values less than 50, strontium yttrium values between 50 and 150 and more than 150. And very interestingly, they, oh, and, and sorry, and the, uh, the color codes here, they indicate the exolvable amount or the maximum amount that you exolve, that you might exolve from this magmatic system based on the copper concentrations that we have seen before, between 20 and, and 50, 50 ppm. So what is important is that this part, the pink part here, are the systems which are potentially richest in, in copper. And incidentally, they, they fall within the range between 50 and 150, which is the range that, of uh, strontium yttrium value, which is the range that we observe in the natural uh, porphyry deposit. So why is it uh, so? What is telling us this? I will come to this uh, in the next uh, slide. This is just to show you that uh, this uh, is the plot uh, that we have seen before with the, <coughs> with the time scales of formation of different porphyry deposits uh, and their copper endowment versus uh, Monte Carlo simulation of uh, magmatic systems which, in which the injection of basaltic melt coming from the crust mantle interface uh, occurs at shallow level, le less than 0.4 gigapascal. So for these uh, shallow level systems, the potential of exolve copper, this is 100% efficiency, and this, the color coded are 50% efficiency, it's always lower than the copper precipitation rate in this deposit. So apparently, if you add uh, basaltic melt at shallow crustal level, you will never be able to explain how this, how especially maybe the, the small deposits, well, the, small, the, relative, the smaller deposits, but not the super giant ones because uh, the exolution rate is not keeping the pace with the exolution rate that we observe by in, in these uh, uh, super large uh, deposits. In contrast, this is the plot for uh, systems which are uh, formed at a higher depth as well. And uh, this is exolvable, uh, again, exolvable copper. These are the copper endowments uh, versus the overall duration of ore deposition in the deposit. And you can see that there is a very good overlap. In this plot, we have additional information, which are always uh, the same. The color codes are the pressure. So you can see that uh, the higher is the pressure and the, the more the uh, copper endowment of the system is potentially leading to uh, richer deposits, the black uh, uh, dashed lines uh, are the injection time, the, the duration of the injection times. So the longer is the duration of the injection time, the more you have the possibility to uh, build up copper and fluids in, in, in the crust and to come up with the very large systems. I, we have tried to, to see actually if there is a, a correlation between uh, the duration of the injection time and the uh, formation of these deposits. Unfortunately, there is not enough data to understand clearly what is going on, but uh, from preliminary data, there seems to be not much co correlation because we have a small systems or relatively small system which cor like uh, Coroco Vico, that they, they have quite a long uh, precursor mag magmatic uh, activity and still they are not so big. So it would seem that uh, this is just an upper limiting factor. And uh, the, the most important factor, actually, is uh, the transfer of the amount of magma which is built in uh, a depth in, in the mid to lower crust to upper levels. 
And uh, this to me means that probably tectonics is playing an, an important uh, role in, uh, in ruling and in determining how these uh, magmas are then transferred from the lower to the, to the upper crust. So implementing strontium-metrium uh, ratios in our model it gives us this. These are, again, these Monte Carlo simulations. It, by chance, it comes out, it looks like a volcano with a, with a, with a plume <laughs> here uh, in, in these uh, simulations. So uh, this is a, the strontium-metrium model value through Monte Carlo simulations and the, the amount of hydrosmelt and the exolvable water. And again, interestingly, this is the range of uh, strontium metrium values uh, of productive uh, porphyry copper deposits. It overlaps with the peak in uh, hydrosmelt amount and in exolvable water amount. So I think that this is telling us that strontium metrium values are nothing else than an indication of uh, how much magma is produced in the crust and how much water it contains. So it's a consequence of the productivity of magma in, in, in the cluster. And this is probably why we have this association. And we can go a bit further and now plot here strontium metrium values of magmas in, uh, of our model. Here, these are the different uh, color codes indicate uh, point density versus the copper million ton in fluids and overlap this to the ore deposits. The bars here are uh, one sigma standard deviations. And it's very interesting that the, the Monte Carlo simulations have exactly the same shape and overlap with the natural distribution of, of, uh, of copper, or porphyry copper deposits in, in this plot. We have subdivided here, again, the plot in three parts, less than 50, between 50 and 150, and more than 150. And we can calculate now probability, because these are point density plots. And the probability is shown here. So the colors are the model, and the red the dashed lines are the natural observation from Porphyry Copper database. So we can see that uh, for less than 50 uh, strontium-metrium values, we have a very good match with the, most of the deposits which form with sizes of less than 5 million tons. We have two ex exceptions here, but I think uh, from the database of, uh, of Bob, I, I had only one or two samples from, from, these, uh, from these deposits. So it could be that they are exceptional. It could be that it is due to undersampling. The other interesting point is that between 50 and 150, this is a, the natural uh, probability or the natural distribution of porphyry deposit. This is our model. There is, again, a, a good match between, uh, between the two, which, uh, which indicates uh, that there is some uh, correlation between all these parameters, and uh, it's, uh, it's explaining what we observe. And if we go above 150, we come back again to almost virtually no deposits or very low tonnage, low deposits. And uh, well, just to, to finish up, well, we, I think we, we can explain, uh, we can understand uh, now two, two things that uh, we observe, and, uh, from uh, magma chemistry evolution and uh, time scales of uh, precursor magmatic activity that we observe systematically in many uh, porphyry systems, which are, on one hand, the very long time scales that we can explain with the time needed to build up this uh, uh, large volume of magma somewhere in the crust, especially in, in the deep crust, accompanied by an increasing strontium metrium values. The, uh, color part here indicates uh, the time at which the mineralization comes. So the mineralization comes always uh, towards the end of these magmatic cycles and in association with the high strontium metrium values, which, uh, according to our model, can be explained exactly by the fact that we are reaching, after a certain time of uh, uh, injection, uh, the required volume or the necessary volume to build up and to be transferred subsequently to the, to the lower crust and to deliver enough uh, metal that, as we observe in, the, in, in these deposits. So to sum up, uh, all these indications suggest us that we have a build up. Uh, we, 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 we need two steps to form these deposits. One step 
in which we have uh, enough accumulation of, uh, of magma somewhere in the crust, mostly in the deep crust, <coughs> between 20 and 30 kilometers, perhaps. We need a, a, a an precursor time or an uh, injection time at least uh, of two or three million years to accumulate enough, enough magma. And only after this, we have enough juice, enough water, enough copper to transfer it to shallower level. And from here, at the, at the rate which is governed and ruled by the uh, time scales of porphyry deposits, as we observed. Uh, interestingly, in our, all our simulations, all the magmas which form here are water under saturated, so they don't exalt water here. And uh, we can simulate the, the level at which they become uh, water saturated if we, they would rise uh, uh, adiabatically through the crust, and it would be somewhere between 12, 10 and 12 kilometers, so which is uh, corresponding quite well with the uh, depth of uh, uh, precursor of parental pluton as indicated by other uh, methods. So we have these two steps, and to me these two steps uh, can be associated also with uh, what we observe uh, in terms of geodynamic and, uh, and tectonics. Porphyry copper deposits form usually during long periods of compression, so the long period of compression allows the accumulation of magma in the deep crust, of enough magma, and they form at the end of this compression period, probably when, for some tectonic reason, there is a, the possibility to release and to transfer the large accumulation from the deep to the, to the upper crust at the time scales and the rates which are indicated by the uh, radiometric dating of uh, magmatic hydrothermal systems. So, to come back again to another slide that uh, Jamie yesterday showed, showed uh, we have seen uh, so far what's happening here. We have, uh, we have seen that there is uh, some evidence, of, especially in the Tetian belt, for other kind of porphyry deposits, so-called post-collisional, post-subduction deposits. I think that it would be interesting to carry out some study to see what kind of uh, similarities or differences there could be between these kinds of deposits in terms of uh, magma fluxes and in terms of, especially of copper. There is a, a lot of, uh, uh, well, there, there are some indications or some proposals that uh, these kind of magmas are recycling copper accumulation in the lower crust, so if this is so, could, could it be that we have uh, different magma fluxes recycling higher copper concentrations? So it would be very interesting to try to apply these kind of models uh, also in these settings through systematic studies of uh, of zircon geochronology, which can give us uh, indications of magma fluxes, like the, the study of uh, Luca Caricchi uh, recently in, in 2014 has uh, shown, time scales of porphyry deposit formation, just to compare these settings with, with this and see what are the parameters at play in terms of uh, magma fluxes and, and copper concentrations. So just to end up, I would like to end up with an analogy. So uh, the porphyry time scales are just the tip of, uh, of an iceberg, but we know that from the tip of an iceberg we can know many things, what, what is uh, happening um, below. So I think that uh, through a, a, a good investigation of uh, not only time scales, but also a lot of other parameters, we can start now to infer quantitatively or semi-quantitatively a set of other very precious information like magma volume, magma fluxes, chemistry, and perhaps metal endowment that are essential to develop uh, uh, exploration models or genetic models that can be used for, um, for exploration. And uh, I leave you here and I thank you for your attention.
So, so Massimo, the other main ingredient of a porphyry is, is sulfur, of course. It's not, it's not just copper yeah. metal. How does sulfur behave in, uh, we, in your I, models? I didn't show, I put some, uh, there is plenty of sulfur from, from the simulation. I, I, have, uh, I have done, I didn't show here, but uh, there, there is enough sulfur in the, in the, in the system. Too. I'm sure there's enough, well, we know there's enough sulfur in the system because you wouldn't get deposits yeah. if there wasn't, but um, does it come off at the same time? Is, it, is the sulfur flux completely coupled to the copper. I, I, that I have no, maybe Cyril is going to talk <laughs> about this more in detail. I, I just model really from more the mass balance point, point of view and seeing that there is, I, I don't know about the modalities really. I, 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 I didn't go in, into the, what is happening in, in the upper part of, okay. of the system. Uh, Um, I'm wondering, so with many porphyry systems, it's not only preceded by a, a couple of million years of, of intrusive activity, but several tens of millions of years of facts of volcanic and, and intrusive activity. At what point during that period of, of protracted magmatism do you decide that the system has gone from a, a regular magmatic system to an ore forming system? In, in other words, how long do you, at what point, what's your cutoff for, for duration? I, I mean, the, the, from our simulation, the minimal the minimum, but it's the only minimal, and then you can extend it up. It's uh, two to three million years. It's just, but of course, this is uh, based on the constraint of the model, which uh, has a lot of, of, of uncertainty. But assuming these uh, magma flux rates, we need at least two to, to three million years to build uh, a system which becomes productive. Anything which is uh, above that is is perfectly okay. And then it's uh, the the timing and the time scales and the amount of magma which is transferred from the, uh, the accumulation to the upper crust, which is uh, ruling and controlling the final size of the deposit. You can build up uh, a huge amount of magma and then transfer it only for hundred thousands of years because of tectonics, for instance. There is a tectonic sh shut, off, shut off and you lose uh, the potential. So it's really the, the second part the, the, the time scales of the magmatic hydrothermal system which forms the deposit, which controls the, 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 the size of the, of the deposit. But the first part determines the, 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 the top, the, how much copper you can, or how much metal you can put into the deposit. If you don't have enough incubation time uh, or injection time to build up enough magma, you will not be able to, to build up enough copper in the, in the upper part. What sort of extraction efficiencies did you use when you fifty percent choose? It's a fifty percent. It's 50 a, yeah. It's a, from. I remember I I took it uh, from Mark Kloss. It's, uh, he used uh, this 50%. Of course, there is n no proof of anything that uh, what is the extraction efficiency. Of course, I'm perfectly aware that uh, extraction efficiency can, uh, yeah. can play a big role. And I, I'm saying in this scatter that we see, yeah, well, in, that's in a this correlation number. could be. That's a reasonable number. Um, I once did a mass balance calculation on how, what volume of magma was required to produce, to contain at 30 ppms of copper in the melt, what, uh, at Bingham Canyon, uh, what volume of melt is required in order to produce two billion pounds of copper in the past mining um, and current reserves? It's a cube, six kilometers on an edge, assuming 100% extraction. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was just curious to know how you got your numbers, but thank you. Okay, um, if anybody else has uh, questions uh, uh, for Massimo, um, uh, please grab him at tea and coffee or over a glass of wine later on this evening in the poster session. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Massimo once again for... Thank you.